Uh, thank you, Aurora. I greatly appreciate that. And thank you to everyone who is on the call today. Uh, as Aurora mentioned, this is our first training series for 2023. We started this uh, back last year with our partner foundations, the Weingart Foundation, the Wellness uh, California Wellness Center, Liberty Hill, and the United Way. Uh, just for an opportunity for grantees, as well as other individuals in the community to get a better understanding of how to get involved in the process of uh, uh, civic engagement. Uh, I think we've had uh, a wonderful success to date. Um, we've had over 200 individuals that have RSVP'd for this particular training. So we're definitely looking forward to this one as well as the future ones uh, coming up. Uh, just a couple housekeeping items. Uh, like I said, this is the first of four trainings. Uh, our next training will be June 1st. Uh, after that, September 7th and then December 7th. Uh, within the, the time frame uh, are coming up on those days, we will provide you with information pertaining to those trainings, uh, but they just wanna make sure I give you a heads up on those particular uh, uh, trainings. Uh, the second thing I wanna make sure is that uh, you utilize the question and answer feature here uh, during this webinar. What we will be doing is each presenter will have an opportunity to give their presentation. And after each uh, section, you'll be given a chance to ask questions, one or two, uh, depending on the time frame. Uh, and I will go ahead and facilitate that with those presenters as well. Uh, so with that being said, I humbly would like to go ahead and introduce our presenters for today. Uh, coming from the California Policy and Budget Center. Uh, we have Chris Hone, he is the Executive Director. Uh, we have Adriana Ramos Yamamoto, who serves as the Senior Policy Analyst, as well as Jonathan Kaplan, who also serves as, the, uh, as a Senior Policy Analyst for the Center. So without further ado, I will go ahead and pass it over to them so they can go ahead and start their presentation. Thank you so very much. Great, you, great. thank you, John. Thank you, Aurora. Um, thank you all for joining us today to talk about how to better understand the state budget process. This presentation is part of a series of tools that we provide on uh, the state budget and to help um, you, your organizations, your allies, uh, and uh, be empowered to take action on the state budget and to access the state budget process by understanding the information better. And we stand as a resource for you all to do that, uh, both here today in this session and as needed with whatever assistance we can try and provide to you all thereafter. Um, the presentation is part of, um, like I said, a, a series of tools. We call it Dollars in Democracy, but the whole point is to give you an introduction to the state budget process. It's sort of a 101 version that occasionally is at the kind of 30,000 foot level, and at other times it's down at the one foot level. And so we'll, we're going to dig into some details sometimes. Sometimes we'll float back up and we'll take some questions uh, and discussion along the way uh, in case we haven't covered something that you have that you have some interest in. Uh, so we'll go to the next slide. We always start these presentations by saying that budgets are statements of our values and priorities. They are far more than dollars and cents. Uh, we always think we should remember that the budget represents the human face uh, of Californians because state budget choices affect all Californians in some way. State, the state budget choices we make, in essence, are the biggest public policy choice the state makes in any given year because where we put the state's ample resources matters. Um, and there is no bigger set of policy decisions that state lead leaders make in such a comprehensive fashion as part of one process. So it's our biggest policy choice we make in any given year, at least of, in our state of California. Next slide. As I said, budget choices also affect all Californians. Um, the state budget decisions help to determine things like whether kids have a safe place to play uh, and learn while their parents are working, whether youth have access to affordable college education, whether people with disabilities and older adults have access to the care and supports they need, and whether our state's revenues are adequate to meet those kinds of needs of Californians and, those and whether those revenues are raised 
in a fair and equitable fashion. So at a fundamental level, uh, budget choices answer the question of what kind of California do we want to live in? Uh, and so budgets are values and the answer to the choice of what kind of California we want to live in. Those are sort of our two biggest kind of high point messages about this. So uh, let me give you a quick overview of the presentation. Um, move to the, there we go, thank you. Um, so we're gonna discuss some key facts, which I will do here shortly, and then we'll take some questions. Uh, we're gonna then do a highlight and overview that Adriana will provide of the budget process, its key players, opportunities for where you can be involved and give you a sense of the timeline. We'll take some questions after that. And then Jonathan will review the constitutional framework, the state budget process and the rules that govern it and a lot of what determines the outcome of state budget decisions are actually affected in significant ways by, by measures that are in the constitution, largely that have been approved by voters over many years. And so Jonathan's gonna walk through some of the high level pieces of, the, of, of, those, of that constitutional framework that determines the rules of the game. So we'll move to the next slide and we'll talk about key facts in the state budget. Um, next slide. So a few things to say here. One is to understand that the state budget itself is a combination of state funds and federal funds, which you can see in the next chart. Um, so if you take this year's whole budget, all pieces of it wrapped together, there's over $400 billion that is projected for the budget year that will start on July 1st. The biggest pool of those funds is the state's general fund, which is, about, which is just more than half. Uh, you can think about this general fund as sort of like the state's checking account. This is where the discretion that state leaders have to make decisions about allocations of money lies. And this is where most of the debate and attention happens. But there's a whole other set of funding that's significant. So about a third of the state's funding comes in from the federal government. And I'll say more about that in a few minutes for, for particular services. And then the state has a whole set of other uh, uh, what we call special funds. And special funds mean um, that there are dollars designated for a specific purpose. And there are over 500 of these funds uh, in the state budget. Um, good examples of special funds are things like a mattress recycling fund, a toxic cleanup fund, and a state parks fund. And the easiest way that um, I always think about how this works is for those of us that have ever gone to a state park, you know that if you drive into a state park, you pay a fee. I can't remember what it is now, but it's around $10. So the $10 fee that you pay to get into a state park, those revenues or those that money that's collected goes into a special fund that can only be used to provide the services and infrastructure supports for those state parks. Um, so that's why these special funds are set aside. They're not, they're not in the state general fund where state leaders can make decisions about shifting the funding around between a particular service or a particular program. So that's, um, that's the sort of state and federal fund part of this. There's also state bond funds. I won't say a lot in detail about that now, but these are bonds, the state issues uh, that support various sorts of services and they're, they go over multiple years. The state pays the bonds back through a debt service. So we'll go to the next slide. An another way uh, that we always encourage people to understand the state budget is to think about the state budget as providing significant funding to communities across the state. It's easy to think about the state budget and the state budget process as about the state capital, about a bunch of buildings and state leaders and staff who are making decisions around the state capital. But the biggest impact, the vast majority of the decisions send funding out to our communities, which you can see a depiction of here in this next slide. So um, the biggest chunk of the state's funding actually goes for what we call local assistance for schools, for community college, uh, community college system, for support in terms of cash assistance for people with low incomes, for healthcare through Medi-Cal, uh, for our subsidized child care system and a whole range of other public supports. And some of the dollars that aren't even in this local assistance category also go out to local communities. So the state operations category, as the state calls it, includes the funding that goes out 
for example, to the Cal State University and University of California systems, significant funding which lands in a host of communities around the state and provides education services uh, um, to people that provide economic opportunity. And even the capital outlay category, the, the, the infrastructure, the money that's there for infrastructure, which is where those bond funds largely are located from the prior slide, most of that money is flowing out locally for things like highways, water supply, flood control, and a variety of other uh, transportation and other climate change and other sorts of infrastructure projects. So the budget itself is largely about dollars that flow into local communities, just reinforcing that big, this is a huge policy decision. It should reflect our values, our priorities, and the kind of state we wanna live in. And we'll go to the next slide. So in terms of where the money goes and what the money supports, there's a broad array of public services and systems. I've mentioned a few of those. So um, you can see that in the next couple of slides. So in terms of the dollars that are coming in um, uh, for general fund and special fund spending, which is a little under $300 billion, over two thirds of those dollars are going to support health and human services, and then K through 12 education and higher education. So you can see that a little over a third, about 35%, uh, in, at least in terms of the budget that's proposed for this next year, would go to health and human services. Uh, about a uh, little more than a quarter, it goes to K through 12 education. And then higher education is just under 8%. Um, cor the correction system is the next category, about 6%. But you can see that the big spending here happens in the health, human services, and education arenas. Next slide, yeah. And in terms of those federal funds, it's also important to understand that the vast majority of those dollars are actually flowing specifically into health and human services. So for example, the next year's budget, at least as currently proposed, uh, the, the $135 billion in federal funds three quarters of those funds go to health and human services. And these are federal dollars that flow into California that help the state cover the costs of providing affordable health care for folks with low incomes, providing safety net and human service supports that, that provide cash assistance, food assistance, subsidized child care, et cetera. But there's a combination of federal and state dollars, in some cases, primarily federal, uh, that is the reason that most of the federal dollars are coming into the health and human services arena. Of course, there are other dollars. There's funding that flows for highways and roads and infrastructure through transportation dollars. There's K through 12 education support that comes in various ways. Um, so the federal dollars are significant in all instances, but the big money here is actually in the health and human services arena. And one of the things I haven't covered in this introduction is where the money comes from. Um, we haven't updated that slide yet, but um, I would just note that about two thirds of the state's revenue comes in through the personal income tax. Um, about 20, a little over 20%, I think, well, I haven't seen the updated numbers, is generated through the local sales taxes that we all pay when we make purchases. And then the third highest total of revenue is coming from taxes on corporations. So three primary taxes that fund the state government, but the big animal there is the state's income tax, which is, as we say, a progressive income tax. That means um, that those who have more or who have more income are asked to pay more in terms of higher tax rates. Uh, so that's where the money comes from. Those are the key facts about the state budget. I'm gonna pause and stop there so we can take any clarifying questions that are needed. And then I'll um, hand this over to Adriana. Uh, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to add those into the question and answer section. Uh, as of right now, there aren't any questions. So I'll hold it for maybe a few more seconds to get anyone who may have a question on that introductory part in. Okay, seeing none. And if you do, always remember that we'll have an opportunity to ask more questions at the overall ending of the session as well. So um, I believe uh, Adriana. Great, thank you, LaJohn. One of the main ideas that we like to stress during this presentation is that the state budget is part of a budget package. 
the budget package is composed of budget bills and budget related trailer bills. Each year's budget package is pretty big, unsurprisingly. So for example, as of September 2022, the budget package for the 2022-23 fiscal year consisted of roughly 60 bills, totaling thousands of pages. So let's talk a little bit more about budget bills and what they are. Budget bills provide appropriations. And appropriations are essentially the individual line items in the budget. These appropriations authorize a state agency, department, or other entity to spend money from a specific fund for a specific purpose. Essentially, money can't be spent unless it has been formally appropriated. Budget bills then move through the Assembly Budget Committee and the Senate Budget and Fiscal Review Committee on their own timeline. This is different as budget bills do not move through the legislature's policy bill process, budget bills have their own track that they follow. However, there can be and always is more than a single budget bill in each year's budget package. But the initial budget bill passed by the legislature and then signed by the governor is known as the Budget Act. So this middle image that you can see here on this slide is the Legislative Council summary of last year's Budget Act, uh, Senate Bill 154, which was passed by the legislature and signed into law last June. This summary or the digest appears at the outset of the bill, which is nearly 900 pages long. And to build on this, we have what are known as the Budget Bill Junior, which is an informal term for bills that amend the Budget Act. And there's no limit on the number of budget bill juniors. So let's now take a closer look at the trailer bills. Like budget bills, trailer bills generally move through the legislature's budget committees, but can move in other ways, such as through the policy bill process. Examples of bills that may move independently of the budget bill, but still are considered part of the budget package include proposals that require a two thirds vote, such as tax increases, proposed constitutional amendments and certain proposed bonds. They may also include majority vote bills, such as those that expanded Medi-Cal recently, for instance. Oh, whoops. Trailer bills also generally make changes to state law related to the budget. So put differently, trailer bills generally make the statutory changes that are needed in order to implement the policies that are assumed in the budget. And I, I say generally for two reasons. So the first is that trailer bills can do other things than change state law. So for instance, um, a bill proposing a constitutional amendment or general obligation bond and then the second um, is that a trailer technically doesn't have to, a trailer bill technically doesn't have to relate directly to the budget bill. It can do anything that the legislature wants it to do. However, there will generally be at least a distant link to something in the budget bill. So switching gears, um, or actually I'll just pause here if there's any questions that have come in um, for a moment. And if not, I can go ahead and continue. Actually, yes, uh, we did have a previous question that was answered by Chris, um, but I'll go ahead and ask this one here. In states that do not have or don't have sales tax, what is an example of how they compensate in their budget? I'm, I'm happy to jump in on this one. The, 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 the makeup of revenues that the state of California has is actually in the terms of like there being a, a, a personal income tax, a sales tax, and a corporation tax is pretty typical across most states. There are some state, there, there are some states, just a few that don't have a sales tax. And as you might expect, they then become more reliant on um, income and corporation taxes. Uh, there, but it's actually more common that some states don't have an income tax. Therefore, they're very reliant on the sales tax. Um, so it's not, there aren't a lot of mystery tax sources out there other than the ones we've mentioned. Um, 
The, the, the only other exception I might note is that some of the natural resource rich states often produce significant revenue from things like the, the sales and transfers of things like oil and natural gas and um, you know, those sorts of natural resources. So, but, the, but otherwise it tends to be some mix of income and sales taxes in most places. Uh, there was one more question. Uh, Chris, if you don't mind just sharing your response, but the question was, can you share any ballpark figures of the state revenue? Yeah, the, the governor's projection for the, and, and understand it's a projection made in January for a fiscal year that starts six months later in early July. Uh, but that projection for the state's general fund, which is where, we, like I said earlier, we, we try to focus, is about $230 billion. Uh, I would note that's lower than the current fiscal year that we're in now, which is because of economic conditions uh, that have driven the revenue picture up down a bit. I would also just note, as I said in the response, um, what the revenue picture looks like is murkier than normal right now in some ways, because we don't know how economic conditions are going to continue to affect the state's revenues. And uh, because of the storms, the federal government and to some degree the state government are now allowing uh, people who are in affected counties to delay filing their taxes. Um, and the April 15th tax deadline, which would be the normal deadline, actually helps the state really understand what its revenue picture will look like. So things are getting a little murkier because we're trying to be helpful to people who are in storm ravaged communities. Uh, so it may make it harder this year in terms of the budget process. And then just one more question and then I'll have Adriana continue. It says, like some council members have, do state assembly members have a pot of annual discretionary funds that can be used for specific projects or activities? No, it doesn't work that way at the state. So they all they have to reach agreement together um, uh, on, an, on, a, on a budget that makes allocations. They certainly try to make they certainly try to, you know, make their case for decisions that will have a greater impact on their community, but they don't have a discretionary pot that they get to make decisions about alone. Thank you so very much. Uh, Adriana, back to you. Thank you, LaJohn, and thank you, Chris. Those answers were really interesting. So thank you for raising those. And again, please feel free to continue to drop your questions in the Q&A chat. So switching gears now, let's turn to the state budget process. I'm going to provide a high level overview of who the key players are, the opportunities for public involvement and the timeline. So the key players in the state budget process are, surprise, surprise, <laughs> Governor Gavin Newsom, who took office in January, 2019, as you all know, the legislature represented here by the legislative leaders, Tony Atkins and Anthony Rendon. And collectively, the governor and legislative leaders are known as the big three because of the pivotal role that they play in budget negotiations each year. And last but not least, Californians also have their say through the budget process. So taking a step back, in California, as I'm sure you all know, the governor has the lead role in crafting the budget. And this is because California has an executive-centered budget process that gives a lot of authority and power to the governor and their Department of Finance. The governor essentially has the first word in budget deliberations because they propose the budget each January. Um, and in addition, the governor can veto bills in the budget package and can veto all or part of individual appropriations, otherwise known as the line item veto. This gives the governor a lot of leverage and a major ability to shape the budget package since it's pretty difficult to override a veto. It takes a two thirds vote of each house. So the proposed budget is released in January and it shows spending for the current and prior years uh, and proposed spending for the upcoming state fiscal year, which Chris has already touched on. The budget summary provides the governor's economic and revenue outlook it highlights major policy initiatives, 
And it also summarize key, summarizes key spending in the proposed budget. And the May revision, which is released in May, updates the governor's economic and revenue outlook, revises or withdraws policy initiatives that were included in the January proposal. And it also includes updates uh, on the spending assumed in the governor's budget. So moving on to the legislature, the legislature also plays a key role um, in reviewing and revising the governor's proposals and adding new proposals with the help of the legislative analyst office. The key players here are the chair of the Senate Budget and Fiscal Review Committee, Nancy Skinner, the chair of the Assembly Budget Committee, Phil Ting, and the legislative analyst, Gabriel Patek, who leads a team that provides fiscal and policy advice to the legislature. Assembly and Senate budget subcommittees hold dozens of hearings beginning in February to review the governor's proposed budget. In general, the legislature approves, rejects, or modifies the governor's proposals and can substantially revise the budget by adding or cutting new spending or new programs. They essentially use the governor's proposal as the basis for developing their own versions of the budget and advancing their own policy initiatives prior to negotiating a final deal with the governor. And of course, members of the public can make their voices heard during the budget process. And um, I'll hand it over to Chris to speak a little bit more on this. Yeah, so there are a number of ways that you can have your say in this. So one way is to submit written testimony. So you don't necessarily have to be in person in Sacramento. You can submit written testimony and submit it to the budget committee websites and subcommittee websites. Um, uh, you could also, um, uh, you could, you know, you can also, of course, attend a hearing and testify in person. Uh, details included in the agendas and the daily file are also published on the website. Many of the hearings you can actually watch live if you want to, um, not all of them. And the Senate and the Assembly both have sort of different processes in some cases for how you access things that have been affected by the pandemic. Uh, but, there, but the daily information you need to know what agendas are being considered, what issues are being considered are loaded and available on a website and in most cases accessible. Uh, you can testify via phone using a teleconference line uh, and there, those details are also on the Assembly and Senate Budget Committee websites. Um, here again, there are some slight differences in how the Senate and Assembly are doing this um, coming out of the pandemic um, and it doesn't look exactly like it used to, but um, there, there are, we have returned to a period where there are at least there is in-person testimony happening. You can provide the written testimony. And in some cases, you can actually provide the teleconference testimony over the phone or internet in some other fashion. So, so way that, those are ways you can do it now. And, and, if you, and, and we watch, I would just say, we watch that public testimony uh, have a major impact on budget outcomes each year. So I, I, would, I would just encourage you not to take that lightly. It may sound like a huge process and difficult to access, but uh, every year we watch testimony from organizations, advocates, organizers, individual members of the public shape and affect the outcomes in terms of what the legislature pushes back with, with the governor or on the governor's revised proposals. Yes, thank you, Chris. Uh, so to recap, Californians can make their voices heard during the budget process but building relationships with policymakers and their staff is really key to influencing budget and policy choices. So the power really does lay with the people. Now, before I talk about the timeline, um, I wanna first mention that there's no off season for the state budget and no clear stop and start dates. Someone in Sacramento is always thinking about and or working on the state budget. Because budget decisions are made throughout the year, there are also plenty of opportunities for budget advocacy all year long. This next slide is very difficult to read. Uh, it's, I just wanted to show a visual representation of the state budget process. Um, and this infographic 
which our team lovingly refers to as the Death Star, um, for those of you who are Star Wars fans. Uh, but this, this infographic is available on our website. Um, so again, I know it's hard to read, but it shows the key deadlines and events, as well as opportunities for public input. So to break this down a little bit, starting with the July to the December period, as most of the budget work is happening behind the scenes during this time. So if you have relationships with officials or staff in the administration, this is a good time to try to get your priorities in the governor's January proposal or to start building or cultivating those relationships. Legislative leaders are also developing their own priorities for the upcoming budget year. And they often release what are called budget blueprints before the new calendar year begins, which outlines their overarching priorities for the next fiscal year. Advocates can build or utilize relationships with legislators and their staff to have their priorities included in the budget and to suggest hearings. Uh, the January to mid-May period is much more public facing with opportunities to react to the governor's proposals and testify at legislative budget hearings. So as we all mentioned already, the governor proposes a budget by January 10th. Um, and the proposed budget includes the economic and revenue outlook, the major policy initiatives and key spending. Um, after which budget subcommittees hold hearings to review the governor's proposals and they also begin crafting the assembly and Senate versions of the budget. The mid-May to June period is very fast paced, but there are still a few opportunities to get involved by testifying at hearings and meeting with legislators and staff. So um, the May revision is released by, by May 14th and it updates the governor's January proposals and spending that are uh, assumed in the governor's budget. There's really only about three weeks after the May revision is released before the legislature then has to finalize and pass its budget bill by June 15th. And ultimately, it'll come down to the big three again, um, the governor and the leaders of the Senate and Assembly to negotiate the final outlines of the budget package. So that covers the state budget process. And before I hand it over to Jonathan to talk about the constitutional framework, um, I'll go ahead and pause and see if there are any open questions. Uh, great. Uh, so just one question that popped up here in the chat. It says, can the document that you just shared be emailed to participants as post-webinar material? Oh, absolutely. I'd be happy to, to share um, that resource as well as some of the other um, resources that you all may be interested that are available on our, on our website. So thank you for asking. Yeah, and as a follow-up to that, uh, next week we will also be sending out a post-election, uh, I'm sorry, a post-event email uh, with all of this information as well that we received from the center uh, as a collective. So we'll get, take care of that as well. Uh, are there any other questions before we turn it over to Jonathan and the constitutional framework? I want to just jump in uh, again and also share. I really want to reinforce what um, Adriana said when she first started talking about how the budget is cyclical, uh, that in terms of your own involvement and how you're thinking about accessing it, we spend a lot of time, time at least, the, you know, the sort of public facing part as Adriana said, is often the January to June or the January to sort of late May period of time because there are proposals to react to. But if you're trying to get something done that it will give it the highest chance of success, getting your proposal into something the governor's office is actually going to pitch themselves or into the proposals that people in the legislature will be making is the strong, you know, creates the strongest likelihood that you will actually see the policy enacted. It's much harder to do that in a reactionary nature once the governor has made his proposals or once state leaders are moving through their own process. So, you know, as you think about budget advocacy, think about that July to November, December period as one that has real opportunities if you're able to create some relationship with agency staff or legislative staff or with your, your, your leaders from your community. 
Great. Thank you so very much for that, Chris. Uh, we'll now turn it over to Jonathan. Thanks so much. And thanks, Chris and Adriana, for a uh, helpful background here as to what the budget includes, how the budget process works. And I would just double down on uh, what Chris just said as well around relationships being one of the crucial pieces of being able to uh, sort of participate in the process, whether it be from that July through November period or otherwise, uh, it's uh, really key that you're establishing relationships uh, with folks that are involved in this process, whether it be at the legislative, uh, in the legislative body or uh, or other parts. Um, and I'll be talking to you a little bit about sort of how um, the framework here sort of plays into that. Um, so I'm gonna, uh, my, my, uh, my part of the presentation here is to talk to, talk to you all about the constitutional framework for the state budget process. Um, the reason why uh, we're talking about this constitutional framework uh, is because it's a pretty crucial piece of understanding how the budget process works and how you uh, would engage with it. And for example, uh, one of the things that was included in Adriana's sort of uh, timeline that she was talking about is on January 10th, the governor proposes a budget uh, and on, uh, and that January 10th is actually time is in the Constitution. It, it, the Constitution states that the governor must present a budget to the legislature uh, that's balanced by January 10th. Uh, and commensurately, uh, there's also a constitutional deadline that says that by June 15th each year, the, uh, the legislature uh, must pass a budget bill. I'll be talking to you a little bit about that as well. So these are pieces that are actually outlined uh, in the state constitution. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you about some of the more uh, detailed part of that uh, as we as we go through this constitutional framework portion of the presentation. Uh, next slide, please. So the reason we're talking about California's constitution is because it establishes the basic rules, some of the basic rules I just talked about. For example, that January 10th uh, deadline for a governor to propose a budget and a June 15th uh, deadline for uh, a budget bill to be passed each year. Um, but the challenge that we face, uh, and I face uh, partly here this afternoon, is that California's constitution is very long and also complex. Uh, um, so to give a sense about that length and complexity, uh, we're going to do some comparison here. We're going to talk first about the U.S. Constitution um, and then make a comparison to the state constitution. The U.S. Constitution, uh, which is roughly 240 years old, uh, is less than 8,000 words long and has been amended 27 times. Uh, and as a frame of reference here, the state constitution, California's constitution, uh, is roughly 10 times as long, and it's been amended uh, 20 times as often. Um, so that gives you a sort of a rough sense as to, uh, you know, basically California's constitution being fairly lengthy and complex. Uh, one of the reasons why it is as complex as it is, is because voters um, have over the years uh, passed a series of measures that have done these amendments, these 500 plus amendments. Um, and these amendments uh, are really some of that constitutional framework that we're talking about in terms of uh, the rules that are established in the California Constitution about the state budget process. Uh, next slide, thanks. So what we're gonna be focused on uh, for the next 15 minutes or so is uh, several ballot measures that uh, have dated back to the 1970s that have affected the state budget and the state budget process. Uh, this graphic, the next one uh, in the slide deck, shows 10 of these, uh, of these measures. Um, I'm not gonna be talking about all of them with you uh, this afternoon, I, but I will be focusing on several of them. And just to you understand, so you understand, this is not all of the measures that have existed uh, uh, since the 1970s that have affected the state budget and budget process. They're just uh, um, a selection um, that we've uh, pulled out to sort of focus on sort of the key measures that have affected the state budget process. One key fact um, that's important to think about, especially as I talk about the earliest of the two measures here, Prop 13 and Prop 4 uh, from 1978 and 79, is that they were enacted more than 40 years ago at a time when California was far less racially diverse than it is today. Um, and in the late 19, just so we understand sort of a frame of reference here about what happened in the late 1970s relative to today, is that in the late 1970s, California's population was two thirds white. Um, whereas today uh, we are, uh, as a state population, uh, whites represent about one third of the state population. 
Um, so demographic shifts were underway in the late 1970s as the younger portion of the state's population was becoming increasingly racially diverse. And in many ways, decisions made by older, whiter voters in the late 1970s were a racist reaction to the changing demographics that were happening in the state in the 1970s and were continued into the 1980s and beyond. And importantly, these decisions created state and local budgeting constraints that we live with to this day. So decisions that were made long ago are still with us, um, and they were made by voters who, um, who really do not reflect the state of California's demographics as we sit here today and speak with each other. Um, so I'm gonna move first to the first of the ballot measures and probably the most well-known um, that have affected the state constitution uh, and the budget process, Proposition 13, um, which was approved by voters in June of 1978 and made several key changes to the state constitution that affected both local government as well as also the state government. Um, and the uh, impact on local government had significant impacts as relates to what happened with the state budget process. So the first thing I'm gonna look at with Prop 13 is how it affected local governments. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Proposition 13 fundamentally restricted local government's ability to raise revenue. It did this in several ways. It capped property tax rates at 1%. So it limited the property tax rate to 1% of the assessed value of a property. Second, it limited the value of property that could be taxed at that 1%. And it limited it by two ways. One, it only allowed reassessment of property value to market value at the time that that property changed ownership. It also, limited the increase in the value that was to be taxed at that 1% rate. The increase in annual property assessment could only increase by 2% per year, therefore, there, there forward. So those two provisions, capping local property tax rates and limiting the assessment value of property significantly decreased the amount of local property tax revenue that local governments were able to access. In addition, Proposition 13 also restricted local government's ability to raise revenue by, imply, by, in, by having new taxes, by requiring a supermajority vote, a two-thirds vote of the local population to, to approve local what are so-called special taxes. Special taxes include things like parcel taxes and taxes dedicated to specific purposes as opposed to general purposes. So all of these provisions significantly hampered local government's ability to raise revenue. But Prop 13 did not only do uh, restrict revenue, uh, restrict revenue raising at the local level; it did so at the state level as well. Uh, next slide, please. So Proposition 13 uh, restricted the ability of state government to increase revenue uh, through a provision that that said that they that the state legislature uh, could only enact a measure to increase state revenue if both the assembly and the state senate approved that measure with a two-thirds vote majority. That super majority is a very difficult threshold to overcome. So this became very difficult for the legislature to increase state revenue at the state level. And that Prop 13 provision uh, uh, was, was an important change in how California state government operated and the state budget process operated. Now, interestingly, uh, I will be, uh, I'll just note here, this was not uh, a two-thirds supermajority uh, vote to increase state taxes. Uh, I'll be talking to you a little bit more about that when we talk about another ballot measure in a short bit, Prop 26. Um, but just uh, we'll hold that for a moment. I'll talk to you a little bit in a moment about sort of the provisions uh, that are more current that have made it even harder for the state legislature to increase revenue. Now, another key provision in Prop 13 uh, was changing uh, the responsibility for allocation of property tax revenue from counties to the state government. That transfer of responsibility um, led to fundamental changes in how local government, in, in, in the funding of local governments. Um, for example, prior to Proposition 13, local property taxes provided the greatest share of funding for K-12 school districts and community college districts. However, after Proposition 13 passed, 
1978, the largest share of funding for K-14 school districts across the state came from the state budget. Now that shift happened because Proposition 13 reduced local property tax revenues by more than 50% from one year to the next. That bottoming out of, of local government's revenue uh, meant that the state legislature in the following year in 1979 stepped in and bailed out local governments by reallocating the local property tax revenue that used to go to schools and community colleges and instead sent that money to cities, counties, and special districts. That was the bailout of those cities, counties, and special districts. But that left schools and community colleges without the money that was being set aside for them. That was backfilled by the state legislature. The state legislature used the state general fund to provide the money that they took from schools to send to cities, counties, and special districts, and instead provided it from the state general fund. That shift that I just described fundamentally changed how state budgeting worked. Now, the state government was the one responsible for the majority of funding for K-12 schools and community colleges. That meant that schools and community colleges were dependent on the state government, but it also meant that the state budget became now much more involved and had much more demands on it in terms of schools and community colleges. And I'm gonna be talking to you about that in a short bit when I talk about Prop 98. All right, so uh, let's move on to the next slide. Shortly after Proposition 13 was approved in 1978, in the following year, a companion measure was proved by voters in Proposition 4 of 1979, the so-called GAN limit, which established spending limits that apply to state and local governments. The GAN limit intended to prevent state and local government from spending above a certain level of revenue adjusted for changes in population and cost of living. The state was then required to return revenue in excess of these limits to taxpayers. The first time the state exceeded the GAN limits, the GAN spending limit was 1986-87, when the state returned $1 billion to state taxpayers. At that time, concern grew that the GAN limit was gonna result in annual state budget cuts. These concerns were alarming to many, and it caused people in the education community to react and put yet another ballot measure on the ballot the following year after those uh, returns of GAN limit revenues in 1986-87. That next ballot measure is called Proposition 98, which was approved by voters in 1988. Proposition 98 established an annual minimum funding guarantee for K-12 schools and community colleges. In addition to establishing this minimum funding guarantee, it also, it and another measure, which was called Prop 111 in 1990, required the state to take those GAN limit excess revenues and instead of returning them to taxpayers, said 50% of any excess of the GAN limit would go to K-12 schools and community colleges on a per pupil basis, and the other 50% would go to taxpayers. Now, Proposition 98's annual minimum funding guarantee is determined by a series of very complex formulas. Um, in practice, while many in the education community hoped that Prop 98 would create a floor of funding for schools and community colleges, in practice, Prop 98 serves as a ceiling of funding for schools and community colleges. And the reason that's the case is it has to do with those complex formulas I said a second ago. The complex formula, the foundational piece of it is every year's Prop 98 guarantee is determined by the prior year Prop 98 funding level plus a factor of change depending on the complex formula. But each year's guarantee is fundamentally determined by the prior year's funding level. So the legislature is very reluctant to provide more money than the minimum funding guarantee, because if they did so, it would not only increase the Prop 98 guarantee in that year, it would ratchet up the Prop 98 guarantee in successive years. And the reason the legislature is reluctant to do that is because the legislature 
knows that any dollar that's that's in the 98 guarantee is a dollar that is not available for the non prop 98 side of the state budget so this is a key part of state budget process the foundational piece of california state budget is prop 98 prop 98 determines what is available for all other priorities outside of k-12 schools and community colleges and that is a key factor in how state budgeting and the state budget process operates each year. Okay, next slide. We're going to move on now, and I'm going to talk to you about a couple of the provisions that have happened over the last decade or so. Um, the key, couple key provisions that were really crucial that happened in 2010 are Prop 25 and Prop 26. Proposition 25, which was approved by voters in November of 2010, changed the th voting threshold for passing a budget bill and the budget trailer bills that Adriana talked to us about from a two thirds majority to a simple majority. That was a sea change in how budgeting operated at the state level. For those that might be around and may have remembered it, if you were here in 2000, the, the 2000 aughts, there were various years that happened where we did not actually have a state budget or a state budget package, even though there was a June 15th constitutional deadline until late summer and sometimes even into the fall. That was because the legislature required a two thirds vote to pass a budget. And to get that two thirds vote, the majority party depended on the minority party participating in passing budget bills and budget trailer bills. After Prop 25, that changed dramatically. No longer was the majority party required to depend in any way on the minority party for an actual budget bill or a budget trailer bill. And what happened was we had um, we had on time budgets. The other reason we had on time budgets is that Prop 25 had a provision in it that had a penalty for any for all legislators for their salaries and their per diem. That's the amount of money they're given on a daily basis for cost for their travel reimbursements and otherwise, unless they pass that budget bill by June 15th. Every year since 2010, we have had a budget bill by June 15th. Uh, next slide, please. Prop 26 um, was also passed in the very same budget on the very same ballot as Prop 25. And as you recall, I spoke to you when about Prop 13. Uh, Prop 13 had a supermajority to raise any revenue at the state level, but it did not specify a two thirds majority to raise state taxes. The way it worked. Uh, prior to 2010, is if the legislature wanted to raise revenue, um, it could do so by, I'm sorry, if, if the legislature wanted to increase taxes, they could increase taxes on some and reduce revenue somewhere else to have a revenue neutral outcome. That was a way that there was some flexibility for the legislature in how it approached the state budget. Prop 26 changed that. Prop 26 now said that you needed a supermajority or a two thirds vote of both houses of the legislature in order to prove any tax increase. This meant it was much harder for the state legislature to navigate and to be able to deal within the, the confines of what was going on in the state budget. Um, all right, next slide, please. The last, the last measure I'm gonna be speaking with you about today um, is Proposition 2, which was passed by state voters in 2014. Um, Proposition 2 uh, what strengthened what was an existing rainy day fund that the state had uh, that was approved by voters in, in another ballot measure, Prop 58 in 2004. Prop 2 uh, strengthened what, was, is what is technically known as the budget stabilization account, what is really our, called our state rainy day fund, um, and required an annual transfer of 1.5% of state general fund revenues. Every year, 1.5% of annual general fund revenues that come in are taken out and half of that 1.5% is put into the state general fund and half is put, put to pay down state liabilities, sometimes uh, known as budgetary debt. That Proposition two um, also established a separate budget reserve for Proposition 98, for the K-12 schools and community colleges. That Prop that prop 2 reserve is called the Public School System Stabilization Account. It's kind of a tongue twister. The PSSSA, the Prop 98 reserve. And so there's a separate reserve 
set aside for prop uh, for for schools and community colleges in addition to the state's rainy day fund. The state constitution only allows withdrawals from the budget stabilization account if the governor declares a budget emergency and the legislature passes a bill by a majority vote that approves of that withdrawal. Now, the strengthening of the state's rainy day funds through uh, these 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 provisions in Proposition Two have led for a fairly robust uh, reserve now in the California state uh, budget. This year, we have more than thirty billion dollars, for example, set aside in the budget stabilization account uh, and the public school system stabilization account put together. Okay, in conclusion, uh, you know I've gone through quite a history here of ballot measures. Uh, and, and thrown a lot at you in a short period of time. But in conclusion, the state constitution uh, has these several provisions and the framework of that uh, limits the ability of state and local governments to raise revenue. It constrains the amount of money that can be spent on state and local budget priorities. And it requires the state legislature to spend money in particular ways. These provisions make the state budget process complex and challenging, not only for the legislature to navigate, but for the rest of us to understand. I hope that this review has helped shed some light on how the California constitutional framework works and affects the state budget process. And with that, I'm going to turn it back uh, to, Chris, to, to some questions and answers, if we have them, and to Chris to close up. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Actually, we do have a question, I believe, that it would be directed to you, Jonathan. Uh, the question here is, were stabilization accounts touched during COVID? So the short answer to that is no. There, there has not been a withdrawal from the budget stabilization account, uh, that, that rainy day fund uh, since COVID. The, 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 the technical answer, though, is that the public school system stabilization account has several rules associated to it that are actually not discretionary, that they're sort of uh, a backstop, so to speak, if revenues fall or they increase in a given year. And so there has been some ins and outs, so to speak, in the Prop 98 reserve. But as relates to the state's rainy day fund, there has not been a withdrawal from that budget stabilization account uh, since COVID, uh, as a result of COVID or since COVID occurred. And it's worth and it's worth noting that at least so far, the governor is not proposing to withdraw those funds uh, to address a budget shortfall that is projected for this year because of declining revenue projections, although that could change by the time we get to the May revision if conditions continue to worsen. And there are some people in the state legislature who are calling for drawing down some portion of those stabilization funds. Great. Thank you so very much. Oh, another question here. Uh, given how difficult it is for the legislature to change tax revenue, is it just as difficult for the legislature to change tax breaks, like corporate tax breaks? It's a great question. I appreciate it. Uh, the short answer is it is just as difficult for the legislature to address tax breaks. Uh, one of the things that is in uh, that that is there in the constitutional provisions, it takes a simple majority to create a tax break, so to speak, what is called a tax expenditure. Uh, that is the ability of the legislature to reduce taxes by creating tax breaks for corporations only takes a 50% plus one vote. However, because it is a increase, it is a considered a tax increase, if you were to get rid of one of those tax breaks, it requires a two thirds majority vote. So. The legislature has uh, quite a challenge in front of it. it. It is very easy to pass a tax break and it's very difficult to get rid of them once you put them on the books. Awesome, thank you hey, so very hey, much. Jonathan, can I okay. ask, so for the, it wasn't one of the propositions they, that it changed uh, a tax, a tax, um, it changed a tax, a definition of a tax to fees or it implied it to fees as well? Yeah, so that is actually also part of Prop 26, that there was changes in the definitions associated to what was considered a tax, right, and how it is that those taxes were defined. Um, and I would also note that there are, uh, there's a, a ballot initiative that has been proposed for the 2024 ballot that would also make that even more restrictive as relates to the definitions according to what are taxes 
fees and how the legislature has some flexibility in terms of addressing that with a two thirds vote. Great. Uh, thank you guys for that wonderful information. Uh, are there any other qualifying question, uh, clarifying questions that you may have for our panelists here? And we do have some time, um, but if there isn't any questions, I, I definitely wouldn't want to, to drag that along. Uh, but please feel free to ask any questions that you may have to either Adriana, Jonathan, or Chris at this particular time. All right. Uh, not a problem. If you do have questions at a later period of time, you can always feel free to reach out to me and I can get... Up. There it is. Give me just a second here. Uh, so we have a question. It says, can the public still submit testimony uh, between the revised, I'm sorry, between May and June 15th? Yes, you can. Uh, I think I would just underscore what Adriana said, that it's a very short and intense period of time. So the earlier you do so, the better. Um, while the June 15th deadline is the one that's listed in the Constitution, that we have other rules that say that all bills, and remember the budget is a bill, have to be in print for three days time in order to be voted on by the legislature. So that backs it up to June 12th. And then there are some oddities to how the state does its budget work that they still have to basically producing a, a, a thousand page budget package or whatever number of pages it ends up being in a given year and putting it in print ends up being kind of a complex process in and of itself. And it often takes them seven or eight days during that period to do so. So you back up from June 12th into early June, add a couple of weekends and legislators desire to go back to their districts and suddenly you realize that you are that, that the final budget deal is often being struck in very early June, maybe even sometimes in late May. So you really have this very short window of time for your opinions, your perspectives, and your advocacy to occur after the May revision. Great. Thank you so very much for that, Chris. Um, if there isn't, if there aren't any other questions. And I don't believe I see any. What I will do right now uh, as we begin to close is turn it over to Aurora, who will go ahead and uh, provide us with two particular questions. Thank you, Lejon. So I'll go ahead and just ask you to respond to two outro questions and we will wrap up. The first one, does your organization do budget advocacy? Great, folks are already responding. And how comfortable do you feel discussing the budget with members of your organization and or community? Great, we have about 40% participation. It's going up to about 50. Just a few more folks. So I will end the poll and share the results with everyone. You should be able to see them now. Thank you all so much. So I will stop sharing and pass it over to you, Lejan. Thank you so very much, Aurora, for conducting that. Uh, just from the looks of it, it looks like uh, there's half and half. Uh, most of the organizations are doing, about 40% are doing some budget advocacy work. So I'm hoping that this uh, training was very helpful to providing additional information to you and in your, the group that you're dealing with, as well as um, how comfortable are you with actually talking about the budget? So uh, it says most of you guys are moderately comfortable with 69%, which is, is definitely good, moving in the right direction. And this is why we have uh, individuals like Chris, Jonathan, and Adriana to provide us with these helpful resources and, and great information. Um, so with that being said, uh, I want to thank everyone who took the time to be a part of our uh, first of four California Community Foundation Civic Engagement Training Series. I would also like to give a special shout out and thank you to our foundation partners, uh, the Liberty Hill Foundation, the United Way, uh, 
of Greater Los Angeles, the California Wellness Foundation, as well as the Weingart Foundation for their continued support and outreach. Uh, I would like to make a special note that you should all be on the lookout next week, as I mentioned earlier, as you should receive a post-training email, which will include a copy of this recording, as well as any supplemental and helpful information that can be supplied by the California Budget and Policy Center. And last but certainly not least, I would love to give a huge round of applause to our presenters again, Chris Hohn, Adriana Ramos, Yamamoto, and Jonathan Kaplan for providing such invaluable information to help us all have a better understanding of the California state budget process. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to reach out to me directly at LeJohn, I'm LeJohn James at ljames at calfund.org and I'll be happy to assist. So again, I thank you all for attending and I wish you all a very wonderful day. Thank Goodbye. you, LeJohn. I'm actually going to have Adriana do just a quick closing remark. Oh, sure. Sorry about that. I think there. Um, I think when we paused for Q and A, uh, we weren't able to to do some closing remarks. So I'll just do that oh, really quickly. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. <laughs> that's that's on us too. Um, so just gonna share my screen again here. Um, one thing that we'd like to do as we close this presentation is just to bring us back to where we started, because we shared a lot of information about the state budget, including who the, the key players are that make spending decisions. We talked about the timeline as well as opportunities for public involvement. Jonathan shared a lot of information about the constitutional framework and the various propositions that have, that have had a major impact on the state budget and the state budget process. So circling back to where we started, um, Ultimately, as you, as you all move forward in your advocacy work, it's important to, to always keep yourselves grounded and, and keep asking, what is the state budget about and what should it reflect? Because as Chris mentioned earlier, state budget decisions are really a reflection of our values and priorities as Californians as they determine fundamental uh, actions, including whether kids have a safe place to play and learn whether Californians have access to a home and whether people with disabilities and older adults have access to the care that they need in order to thrive. So uh, once again, that concludes our presentation on the state budget process. Uh, please feel free to reach out to our team. You can find our contact information on our website at calbudgetcenter.org. And thank you again for being here today and allowing us to share our knowledge with you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all.